Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1, that's where we will be at today. And we'll look actually at verses 1 through 6. And then after we look at Matthew chapter 1, 1 through 6, we're going to go to the story of Rahab. There was a little girl who uh, was selling apples, and she was blind. And so uh, there was also five businessmen that was running through the church, or through the church, through the airport, trying to catch their next plane. They didn't see the little girl with the apples who was trying to sell them. And five of them ran into her cart, knocking the apples everywhere. Four of them kept running. One of them stopped and helped her pick up the apples. Being blind, she couldn't tell who it was who was helping her, but she did ask him a question. And the question was this, Sir, are you Jesus? Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 6, would you stand for the reading of God's word? This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, his mother was Tamar, Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Abinadab, Abinadab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon, Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab, Rahab, Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth, Obed, the father of Jesse, and you know Jesse, Jesse, the father of David. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this time that we come together, that we can worship you. And Lord, I pray that we do that this blessed Sunday morning. In Jesus' name, amen. And you may be seated. I wanted to share that with you because this is the lineage or the genealogy of Jesus. There were two women who were really outcast of the other people that was mentioned here in his lineage. uh, One was named Rahab and the other was named Ruth. And the reason why it was so odd for them to be listed in the genealogy of Jesus is because they are Gentiles. They don't belong. Jesus is a a Jew. And here we read Rahab and we read Ruth. And in Joshua chapter 2, verses 1 through 2, I'd like to read that to you now, getting on with our uh, series on the book of Joshua. It says, Now Joshua the son of Nun sent out two men from from Acacia Grove to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. So they went and came to the house of a harlot named Rahab and lodged there. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, men have come here tonight from the children of Israel to search out the city. They stopped by the hotel that was sitting on top of the walls of Jericho, and the owner of the hotel was Rahab. Now Rahab was a was an outcast. She was different than anyone else. And I want to share with you those things that made her different. First of all, and I know this may get some upset, but she was a woman. Now, in our Western culture, we accept women, and we would think nothing of a woman owning a business. However, this is not the West. This is the East. The thought of women was that women were property to the men, or they were an accessory to the men. And so Rahab owning a business would be unthought of. But here, we see that she did. 
Not only that, I believe that Rahab was a strong-willed woman. Now, there's nothing wrong with being a strong-willed woman unless you lived in the Middle East. And then that creates a problem. I remember watching Afghanistan, and they was talking about the women, just to get a little closer to home. They were talking about the women and how they were surprised. The media was surprised. They were hiding in their homes when the uh, American troops ha had left. And they didn't understand why they were hiding in their homes. But they were hiding in their homes because it would be very possible they would be put to death. And so that's why, and I, it made me angry. I don't know if you are like myself, but when I watch the news, I have a tendency to argue with the TV, to yell at the TV, thinking that somehow... This is going to change the attitudes of the ones that are sitting at the desk. And of course, it doesn't. And Linda would say to me, would you be quiet? I'm trying to listen to the news. But here, Rahab was a woman, and she was a strong-willed woman, and she owned a business. She was an innkeeper. And then she was from Jericho. If you read the book of Joshua. You know what's coming up. We have a song about it, don't we? Joshua fit the battle or fought the battle of Jericho. She was an enemy to the Israelites because she lived in Jericho. Yet there was something that was different about her. We see with Jericho, Jericho worshipped a moon god and all the other Canaanite gods that, God was stand, that Yahweh God was standing against. Yet we re read further that Rahab believed in Yahweh God. I want to share with you that God is the God of outcasts. God is the God of outcasts. God cares for those who are, well, different. And I don't know about you, but I'm glad that he does. As a matter of fact, I, I have noticed that God takes the differences of people and puts those who think that they're perfectly all right aside. Let me share with you what I mean. I knew a young man when I was going into Hamill Grange College named Ted. Ted, well, he was different. He wore his pants to about here. He had one eyebrow that went from here, went from here to all the way over here. We took care of that one time. Four men held him down and we shaved off that middle part of the eyebrow. He no longer had a unibrow. And it was really easy to make fun of. He crossed his legs further than any woman that I'd ever met. And we made fun of him. I, as a matter of fact, myself, I made him my own personal servant. When I was sitting at the cafeteria, I made him get extra drinks for me and all my friends. I was sitting at the table, and I laughed at him, and, and I said, he'll never be anything. Now, he was real easy to pick on. However, God put me in my place, and my friends in our place. When he was sitting up in a chair for chapel, and you could have heard the talk amongst my friends and myself. Oh, oh my goodness. I, I hope he's not a preacher. Because he could tell stories about us. I hope he's not a preacher that, that, he, that, that he'll be challenging us. And you know what? He wasn't a preacher. He got up and he sang a song. Give them all to Jesus. All the br wounded hearts, the broken toys, the broken dreams. Give them all to Jesus. I'll tell you what. Not only did he do that, he sang like an angel. And it was as though God was talking to me and my friends and saying, See, you're picking on one of mine. There are outcasts all over the place. People that are different than what we are. And I often have thought, as I've gotten older, 
what makes us so right? What makes us so right? Many of you who know me know I wear a cowboy hat. And you also know well we are in the Midwest, not in Texas. remember walking out of a mall one time, and I heard, Woo-hoo! I didn't mind, no big deal. I know I'm an unusual preacher. See, I have a problem with that. But I'll tell you what, God is the God of outcasts. And not only could I tell you story upon story about people that are outcasts, that have made differences in lives, I bet you could too. Things that have made them different, but how God had made something beautiful out of them. God is the God of outcasts. I also want to share with you that God is our protector. Joshua 2, 3 through 7 says that the king came knocking on Rahab's door. You see, he, what he knew was anybody that passed through the gates of Jericho would go to her first. Anybody who went out of Jericho would go to her first. So if anybody would know if there were Israelites spying out the country, she would know. So the king knocked on her door and said, Rahab, have you heard, have you seen anything of the Israelites? Well, Rahab had already had a meeting with the Israelites, and she sent him up to the roof to hide him underneath straw. But that's, this is what she told the king. I haven't seen anybody. I haven't seen him. Why? Because she feared the Lord over the king. She put her trust in God, who was her true protector. Now, once you understand what it meant to challenge a king, if the king was to find that someone had lied to the king, instantly he could put that person to death. So it wasn't a nonchalant, yeah, so I lied to the king, big deal. She put her life on the line for the Israelites, and more importantly, for Yahweh God. And she chose to protect the Israelites. Why? Because she knew that God was her protector. She hid the two Israelites upstairs on the roof. And this is the thing that I love. Did you know that God goes before us? Everywhere we go. Joshua chapter 2, verses 8 to 13 says, Now before they lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land, that the terror of you has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you and when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites, who were on the other side of the Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these stories, heard these things, our hearts melted. Neither did these remain any more courage in anyone because of you. For the Lord your God, He is God, heaven above and on earth beneath. Now, therefore, I beg you, swear to me by the Lord, since I have sworn your kindness, that you also will show kindness to my father's house and give me a true token. And spare my father, my mother, my brothers, my sisters, and all that they have, and deliver our lives from death. I grew up in a Christian home. I knew all the right words. I knew all the things to say. I knew all the hands to shake. I knew how to lead singing. I knew how to sing specials. I knew how to preach. I knew all there was 
to church. But I knew nothing about God. I knew nothing about Jesus Christ. I went off to Cannibal or Grange College. And I lived a rebellious life. I said I didn't want to have anything to do with God. The God of mom and dad. Mom and dad drug us to church every Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Anytime the doors were open, we were drugged to church. And I said, no more. I don't want to have anything to do with God. And I went to school just to party and just to have fun and get away from my mom and dad. I joined a drama group called The New Edition. We traveled all over the United States and, and we performed plays and skits and all those things. We were in Chattanooga, Tennessee, one particular time. My drama director said 30 years ago, they saw a falling star fall as they were looking over the side at Lookout Mountain. Her daughter, as we were standing there in about the same spot, lifted her hand and said, Okay, God, and a falling star fell. All the other people was praising the Lord for showing up, except for me. I backed up, and I said, that didn't happen. I don't care what you said, that, doesn't, that didn't happen. I know what God was saying. He was speaking to all of the other people, but he was saying to me, you want me to show myself? What are you going to do about this? I'd like to say on that particular night, I bowed on my knees and I cried and asked Jesus to be my Lord and Savior, but I did not. I went home and I listened to my dad preach. At 56 years old, my dad died of cardiac arrest. My dad was my God. There was nothing that he could say, nothing that he could do wrong. He was perfect in my eyes. There was one problem on that day. You see, the problem was he died. And it was as though God spoke to me and he said, Now, who is your God? I didn't have an answer for him that day. Three months later, I went to a revival. And I thought I'd do my Christian thing, on my Christian duty, and I'd sit and I'd listen to the preacher walk out the door and think that I'd done what I needed to do. But something drew me to him. And I was there on Tuesday. I was there on Wednesday. I was there on Thursday. And I walked the aisles and I said, I need to get saved. And the pastor asked a question that I'd never heard any other pastor ask. He said, are you ready to get rid of all of your sin? And I said, no. I'm not ready to get rid of all my sin. There's a few that I don't like, but some I'm still having a lot of fun with. And the pastor said, you're not ready. He, he got the evangelist, and the evangelist said, your problem is trust. You need to trust Jesus. I went On Friday, I went to where I worked at. And all day long, I thought about the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I went that Friday night to revival to hear more. You know what the evangelist preached on? The crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know what the invitation was? Only trust Him. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. It seemed to me like on that Friday night... When the band just got up there, he said, okay, everybody can go home. Everybody go home. Go ahead and go home. We're going to talk to Doug tonight. I know that didn't happen, but it seemed like it. I walked forward, and I said, I need to give my life to Jesus Christ. I need to give my life to Jesus Christ. I was ready at that time. And I'll tell you what. He took a heart that was bitter that was hurt, who was scared, 
and he filled it with love. There wasn't anybody there or in the world that I wanted to do any harm to. Why? Because 1 John says, God is love. And I know that I asked Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. You know what? I have a lot of stories. I wrote it in a book. Some of you have got my book. I've wrote a lot of stories in my book, and every one of them is true. I'll tell you how that book happened. I was getting a whole bunch of stories, a whole bunch of illustrations. And I said, God, if you don't want to know the answer, don't ask God questions, I'll tell you. God, what do you want me to do with these stories? And God said, oh, you think they're your stories, do you? He said, they're not your stories to store away in your heart. He said, it's your stories to share with other people. I know because I've, wa- I've listened to him, about five or six preachers every Sunday or uh, er- during the week from different areas. I am an unusual preacher. Matter of fact, Louise saw me today. I don't think she'd mind me sharing. Saw me today, and she said, I think you're the right man for the job. She said, "When you, I love to hear you preach. And she began to talk about the old-time preachers and how they'd preach and, and, and storytell. And I said, you know, I've been accused of being an old-time preacher a long, long time. She said, you just own that. Jesus did something in my life. Jesus did something in my life. And I know that it wasn't for him to say, just hide it, just hold it in. Don't tell the stories. But he said they're for you to share with other people. Why is that? Because I'm going to talk to you for a second. The stories of the hurts and and the things that you've gone through, other people are going through presently. And they're wondering, they're asking the question, is there hope anywhere? In this world. And it's as though Jesus says, wait, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Come here. I want this person to share how I brought this person through. I want this person to share what I've done for them. So that you may know that there is hope in this world. Anybody know that there's COVID going on? We all know that, don't we? And what do we hear time and time and time again? We hear that we might as well bury our heads under the beds and die. That's what we hear. But I am here to tell you that over the past year, I've known person after person after person who said, I went through it and God seen me through it. And I'm on the other side today because there is hope in Jesus. I have a pastor friend of mine right now who is getting off of the respirator from COVID. And here's what the doctors have said. We've not seen anybody else be able to do that. I love those women whenever the doctors say it's hopeless. There's nothing else that we can do. And someone If they would have given me about a month, I would have figured it out my own. But someone rises up and says, but you don't know my God. He can deliver. He can do it. Sitting on a hospital bed, I heard the doctor say, don't you let any doctor tell you that there's not a God. He said, I can't tell you any time that I've gone through surgery, that I didn't know that God was there. Because I couldn't do the things I did. I couldn't, I, I couldn't heal this person. I just knew by textbook. But someone, somewhere, did something. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that that happened. My friend, God did, Jesus did not die on Calvary and stay there. 
Jesus rose from the dead the third day. And he's alive and well today. I know I can tell you story after story after story, but let me tell you what happened Wednesday. Many of you know we're moving. And our furniture now is out the house. But we'll have boxes for eternity, I believe. And I was feeling overwhelmed with, deli- uh, with bringing boxes to the truck. And I sat in the truck just waiting, just waiting for Linda to get in the truck. And you know what I heard? God will make a way when there seems to be no way. And I said, God sent me that song right there when I was feeling overwhelmed that God will make a way when there seems to be no way. That's the God I serve. Billy Graham was asked one time if he felt that the church was filled with 50% of lost people. The church. Because he made that statement some time ago. He said 50% of the people that are in church pews today are lost. A preacher asked him one time if he still felt that was true. Billy Graham shook his head and he said he didn't. He said 75% are lost and going to hell. That's overwhelming in itself. And you see, I want to bring that up for this very reason. Every time that I preach, I strive to give the gospel message because I don't know who's lost and who's saved. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart He's raised from the dead, you will be saved. And if we have done that, we are saved. But I dare to stand in front of you today and tell you there are people who are hiding behind trees today who have said, I can lead singing. I can go to church every Sunday. I can act like a Christian. And I have no doubt that you can. But if you go with that attitude without doing what Romans 10, 9 says, you will split hell wide open. Let me share with you one verse that led me to following Jesus Christ to be my Lord and Savior. And it was this. In the last days, there will be many that have said, Lord, Lord, Haven't I done this or that or this? And listen to the Lord's response. I will say, I never knew you. Not I knew you once and I forgot who you were. I never knew you. I know where I was. Sitting in pews, lost and acting like a Christian. But what I'd hate is when the Lord comes back that there will be people who I've preached to that will have done the same thing. It's not at all about me. And in this story, it wasn't about Rahab. If you talk to Rahab, if we brought Rahab up today, she would say, you've read my story, you've seen my story. God is the God of outcasts. God is my protector. And God is the one who put the story in my heart. But it's not about me. It's all about God. And Hebrews says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Think about that for a moment. The God of Rahab is our God as well. And knowing that, I know he'll see me free. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this time that we come together. And I pray, Lord, that there's someone here who does not know you, that they will before it's too late. Lord, thank you for that red cord that was hung out the window that showed Rahab's faith. 
And Lord, I pray that we hang out our cord to show our faith. Lord, if there's someone here who needs to join the church, who, who needs to rededicate their life, whatever it is, during this time of invitation, Lord, I pray that they will get it right with you. In Jesus' name, amen.